Uh, hello, uh, this is the Fundamentals of Micro and Nano Fabrication. I am Sushobha Navasi from Center for Nano Science, ISC Bangalore. And this is the start of a course on Micro and Nano Fabrication where we go into the details of unit processes. What is the physics behind them? What are the engineering details? And look at some basic characterizations. Uh, in this first lecture, I will try to briefly introduce what is microfabrication, what are the various jargon that we use in the microfabrication, and also give you a very quick overview of the various things that we shall cover in detail in this course. So from each module, I will pick a couple of slides, uh, very generally explain to you what are we trying to do in that step. The details, of course, shall wait the future lectures. Okay, So let's get started. So, introduction to microfabrication. Uh, hmm. All right. So, what is microfabrication? Uh, microfabrication is trying to make things at a very small scale, uh, typically micro, micron scale, or sometimes even in the nano scale. Here is an example of a gyroscope that has been fabricated at IIC Bangalore. This is courtesy Professor Rudra Pratap. Uh, what you are seeing is a moving mass and that moving mass is what provides the gyroscopic functionality. The details of the device is not important. What is important is to look at the scale bar. What you are looking at is a 100 micron scale bar. So the features that you see on this on the left hand side are actually much smaller, uh, something on the order of 1 to 10 microns. Such gyroscopes are significantly smaller than the macro gyroscopes that are typically used in uh, systems. Uh, such in systems, uh, an example of where this micro fabricated gyroscope is used is in your cell phones. Uh, this is the device that actually detects when your cell phone tilts, right, from portrait mode to landscape mode. This is the device that actually detects that motion. And to give you a fair comparison, on, on roughly the same scale bar is the width of a human hair. So, as you can imagine these are amazingly small features and this is an amazing feat of engineering that we can actually make reliably uh, such small features and mass produce them okay so how do we do that is what is microfabrication all about here's another example of something that has been fabricated but now at the nano scale so 100 nanometers is essentially a tenth of a micron so this is 0 0.0001 mm for scale and this is the top view of a fa of a IC that is fabricated by Intel. Uh, this is an IC that was made at a 14 nanometer node. Uh, what this essentially means is the smallest feature is on the order of 14 nanometers. If you look into detail in this picture, you can actually see that several other features are much larger, but the smallest features that you can actually start to see are on 100 nanometers or smaller. Uh, individual device can sometimes be even smaller that are even not visible on this scale. And we can fabricate millions, sometimes billions of these transistors in a single die reliably and in a mass uh, and in a mass manufacturing facility. And the ability to do that at low cost has essentially led to the computer revolution and the electronics revolution that you see all around us. And if you take this system to the extreme and start looking at below the nano scale, you start getting into the regime where it is a few atoms. So here is an example of graphene, a very popular semiconducting material. Uh, people have been looking at it for a while now. What you are looking at here is a single sheet of graphene. A single sheet of graphene is one atom thick. So this is a membrane that is literally one atom thick. Of course, the lateral sizes are a lot bigger, but it is again amazing that we are able to get this amount of control and how we do that is through the tools of microfabrication. So now why should you care uh, both as a student but more interestingly as a consumer or as a taxpayer who funds research into micro and nanofabrication? Well partly because there are a lot of benefits to be gained. So typically if you take any system, it has a typical cost performance trade-off. Uh, what that means is in order to get higher performance, you need higher cost. So if you look at the slide, uh, this is what a typical cost performance curve looks like. Uh, this curve is often not linear. Uh, what that means is if you want low cost and low performance and if you want to now upgrade that cost and performance, the cost typically comes is much uh, scales much faster than performance does. So here is an example, an auto is only worth $3,000 give or take, but an F1 car which is probably the most engineered locomotive car that we have is upwards of 10 million. right? So the performance has not scaled by orders of magnitude, 
what the cost has. So if you can imagine this cost is essentially a log scale, it is not a linear scale. And this is true for virtually uh, most technologies that we have seen no matter what. Electronics is a notable exception to this. Uh, there are several ways to measure performance in electronics, but two ways in which you can measure performance is energy consumption and the other one is transistor speed, which is how fast you can do computation. So, if you look in both those aspects, uh, the thermal consumption typically is a function of transistor leakage, which is that how much current you leak. Uh, so, the farther you go down, the lower the transistor leakage, the lower your energy consumption hopefully. And the other metric is of course, speed of the transistor. So, as you go towards the right, the speed of the transistor increases. So, in a night, so a superior technology is one where you are lower in this quadrant and higher at this quadrant, which is basically which means you are in this side of the graph. If you look at successive technologies, as the transistor has become smaller from 65 nanometers to 45 to 32 and down to 22 nanometers, it has always improved performance. It has reduced leakages, it has reduced power consumption and it has increased speed. But at the same time, this has happened while the cost of the transistor has continuously fallen. The cost of transistor has not increased as the cost performance curve would suggest, but rather reduced. And in my knowledge, there is really no other technology that does this. And the reason this happens in electronics is because of scaling and because of the ability to make things continuously smaller. And that, in my opinion, is the primary reason why electronics revolution has taken place. Every year computers get better, but they also get cheaper. Every year cell phones get better, but they also get cheaper. And that has allowed the percolation of electronics in every facet of our life. So that is why you should care. So how do we make features this small? Partly it is a, a library of unit processes. Uh, so, there is no one process that gets it. So, we have a library of processes and you and an intelligent en engineer selects which is the right process to do and in which sequence to do this to enable the final product. Uh, very generally, the library of products can probably be broken down into four categories. So, first is substrate selection. What substrate should I use? Um, why? The second is some additive process, some process in which we deposit something. That deposition could be a deposition of uh, a layer of films, a thin film deposition. It could also be a deposition or interpenetration of some atoms, for example, diffusion. Then there needs to be some patterning step. By and large, blanket layers are not engineeringly useful. If you want to make a complex structure, you need some way of patterning it. And if you want to make nano and micro scale structures, then that patterning must be at the nano or the micro scale. And the fourth thing you need is you need some sort of an subtractive step, some step that actually selectively removes material. And if you have all of these, then again a combination of these can lead to any pattern or design that you want to make uh, for your microfabrication process. So let us take each of these steps one by one. Uh, once again, here the idea is to give you a very general feel of things and introduce you to the jargon a little bit, but the details shall come in later modules and lectures. So, substrate. So, in the world of micro and nano fabrication, the substrate in which we do all our work is typically called a wafer. Uh, the reasoning behind this is easy to understand. Here is a picture of a typical silicon wafer. You can see it is uh, very thin and it is relatively large. So, the aspect ratio suggests a chip or a potato chip if you might want. Typically, these substrates are 200 to 2000 micron thick. The workhorse is silicon, by and large 95 percent of the work out there is done on silicon. It is square or circular in shape and it is polished to a mirror shine. Uh, why all each of these things would be more obvious as we go along? The singular feature, the distinguishing feature of this substrate is this extremely pure, uh, arguably one of the purest materials we know how to make. It is uh, in, uh, in the best cases in the state of the art, it can be 99.89 pure which is an amazing level of purity that um, in my opinion, I think only helium can reach. It is in my knowledge only helium can reach and silicon. However, there are other substrates than silicon. Uh, silicon is a semiconductor, but there are also insulating substrate like sapphire. There are also some oxide substrates, etc. Now, before going further, let us first get to first jargon out of the way. What is a semiconductor? A semiconductor is simply speaking a material whose electrical conductivity is somewhere between a metal and an insulator, but that is a very large uh, range and it is not very 
um, it does not give a very intuitive explanation for what a semiconductor is. So, a better explanation often is to talk in terms of uh, numbers, right. So, if you look at a typical conductor say a metal, uh, its conductivity would be around 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 6 ohm centimeter. At the same time, if you compare something like an insulator like glass, its conductivity will be say minus 16, minus 14. That is a very large change in orders of magnitude that is th those are two properties that are separated by 10 to the power 16 orders of magnitude or 10 to the power 18 orders of magnitude right that is a very very large uh, gap. So, semiconductors sum sit somewhere in the middle. More interesting however, is the claim that semiconductors can actually tune their, semi uh, their, their conductivity. If you take a piece of copper and you want to change its conductivity, it is really hard to change it by say more than an order of magnitude. You can introduce some impurities which will reduce it, but very hard to change make it change by orders of magnitude. Similarly, if you take an insulator and you try to change its conductivity, maybe you can make it 10 times worse or 10 times uh, lower, but very hard to make it orders of magnitude difference. Semiconductors are different in that you can actually change the conductivity over orders of magnitude by introducing things called dopants. Okay. So, what are dopants? In order to understand dopants, we have to do a little bit of a chemistry. Um, you can actually uh, explain semiconductors or doping several which ways. There is a chemical approach, there is a physical approach. I will try to keep things simple here. So, let us take silicon. It has 4 valence band because it is in group 4 of the periodic table. So, it bonds in, a, in pure crystal, it bonds to 4 other silicons, right. So, this is what the picture looks like and uh, this is a covalent bond, right. So, the electrons are shared equally. Then what will happen? So, you look at the energy diagram of this, right. A single silicon will have certain atomic levels, these are atomic orbital levels, right. If you take one silicon and you bond it to another silicon, now you have a two silicon and they will probably have slightly split, like the degeneracy will break. So, you will have two energy levels which will be slightly different from each other and then of course, they will be uh, again a couple of energy levels a little higher and couple of energy levels even higher. If you add three silicon atoms, now this degeneracy will split again and now there will be three sub levels in each level. And if you take this to its logical conclusion and actually have a lattice where there are 10 to power 23 or more as, uh, silicon atoms, now these levels are no more levels, they sort of morph into a band where there is a continuous presence of energy levels from some uh, energy level to some energy level. So, you do not have a level per se, you have a band and then you can have several bands. Now, if you start filling electrons in these bands at some point you are you will have you are done with electrons and what you will get is a filled band and an empty band. The distance between the filled and the empty band is called the band gap. The empty band is often called conduction band and the filled band is often called valence band. Now, if this band gap reduces then even a thermal uh, even at sorry room temperature there is enough thermal energy in the system that the electron can actually jump or at least few electrons can jump from the filled level to the empty level. When that actually happens, there are some free electrons in the conduction band and there are some positive charges in the valence band which can move which is what gives this material some conductivity. And in, in the extreme case when the band gap becomes 0 or negative, then the valence and the conduction band or the empty and the filled bands overlap in which case you have a metal. So, this is a metal, this is an insulator, semiconductors are typically in the metal middle. However, this still does not answer the question how are we tuning the conductivity. Uh, this seems like a, a thermodynamic effect which will be fixed at a certain given temperature. In order to understand that we have to go one step further. Till now what we have looked at, this is an intrinsic semiconductor, it does not really have any dopants, so it has a fixed conductivity. However, if you now take this silicon lattice which is group 4 and now substitute it with some element from group 3. Now, remember group 3 has only 3 electrons, so it can only form 3 bonds. So, if you do that, my bad, let us first take the example of substituting with group 5 uh, which has 5 electrons say antimony. Now, that means it has an extra electron and that extra electron is now not bonded to any of the silicon atoms is free to move. Um, in a band diagram picture, this is often represented as that just below the uh, that that above the Fermi level, there are certain extra states, and these states are providing uh, 
the electrons which then go into the conduction band to increase the conductivity. Now, because this the concentration of these free electrons is directly proportional to the how much antimony we have put in the surface in the bulk, we have now a way to tune the number of free electrons. If we can tune the number of free electrons, we can tune the conductivity. So, just by deciding how much dopants to put, we can actually tune the conductivity and that is one of the singular features of semiconductors. Uh, a material would be called insulator if you do not have a dopant that can do this. Now, you can do this with electrons, but if you now substitute with group 3, you can do this with positive charges or holes. Uh, the arguments are similar. Now, you have boron which has only 3 atom, uh, three bonds. So, there is one bond missing which means there is one positive charge there and that positive charge can move. So, by adding n type or p type dopants, you can actually tune the conductivity of a semiconductor. Such mat elements that can do that are called dopants and they are unique to a type of semiconductor. right? So, antimony and boron are dopants for silicon, uh, for gallium arsenide or some other semiconductor they would be different dopants. Uh, which leads us to another interesting fact that all of the semiconductor uh, processing must be done in a clean room. And the reason for that is we are starting with an amazingly pure material and that purity is required to maintain properties the, to maintain the exceptional electronic properties that we have in the semiconductor. But in order to keep that silicon clean while we are doing the processing, the processing must also be done in an ultra clean environment. Uh, typically these are done in clean rooms, these clean rooms are around 1000 to 10,000 times cleaner than your average room, sometimes even more. And in order to keep the clean room clean, you are typically inside a bunny suit, okay, so that you do not contaminate the clean room. With that, uh, let us move from substrate to some additive processing examples. So, the easiest way to do additive processing is to do chemistry. So, you take some substrate and then you flow what we call a precursor. Simply speaking, it is a chemical that at a given temperature would react either with itself or with some other chemical to form the material that we want to deposit. So, if you flow that precursor inside a furnace, that furnace would heat up the substrate. So, that the substrate goes up to the right temperature and then when the precursor sees that temperature, it would react and then form this deposited layer. And all of this can be done in a container which we call a chamber. So, this is what a real system looks like. Here you see some wafers being loaded inside a furnace. On the other side of this furnace will be some inlet which will give you the precursor and some outlet where the byproducts can get out. This is what is typically called chemical vapor deposition. Uh, the name sort of explains itself. We are doing chemistry, chemical and then we are doing this all in the vapor phase. right? So, these precursors typically are gases or vapors of liquids. CVD has come a long way. Uh, these days we can do CVD with near perfect uh, lattice match. Here is an example. So, of silicon epitaxy which is done by CVD. So, here is a silicon substrate uh, on top of which certain silicon has been deposited using CVD and that lat and if you look at in the detail of that uh, silicon lattice that you have grown, it is actually perfect. right? The atoms are perfectly arranged. You can look at its uh, electron diffraction pattern and that also confirms that this is near perfect epitaxy. And you can see this is the interface, while you can make out the interface, the interface is remarkably smooth, there is no impurities, there are no interstitials, oh sorry, no, no uh, islands, there are no de visible defects uh, which shows you how far the CVD process has come about. How do we do that? We will look into detail when we look at CVD. Another example of deposition is to grow a silicon dioxide and silicon which is commonly done. Uh, now, this is a slightly more interesting case because silicon dioxide tends to be amorphous. You are depositing it on a material with silicon which is crystalline. So, you would expect that the interface would be bad, but it turns out it is not uh, through some process, uh, through process maturity as well as dumb luck. Uh, the silicon silicon dioxide interface that we can grow today is nearly perfect and that has actually enabled the whole. Uh, technology of CMOS. The second way in which we can deposit things is through physical vapor. Uh, the, the insight here is that instead of chemical vapors or sort of, uh, sort of gas or liquid uh, based precursors, what you can start with something solid. For example, you can start with aluminum pellet. And if you heat aluminum pellet, at some point the aluminum will melt and once it melts, it will form a vapor and then that vapor can go and get deposited somewhere else. So, what you need in this case is a 
chamber such that the source remains pure and does not react. Uh, some sort of pump so that you can take the oxygen and other things out of the atmosphere out of uh, that constitute the atmosphere out, out of the vacuum chamber and then some substrate which sees uh, the source so that the vapors can go and condense on top. It is very similar to how if you put a lid on top of boiling water, the water will condense on the lid. Right? Primarily this method is used to deposit metals and if I were to ask you that where have you seen something like this before, a good example would be in bulbs. So, what is a bulb? It is basically a vacuum chamber inside which there is a filament that filament grows red hot and uh, the, the difference in that case is that the filament that you are using is very high temperature. So, it is not evaporating, uh, but if you were to put something like aluminum inside the uh, bulb, the aluminum would evaporate and coat the glass of the bulb. The third uh, method, uh, this is the th another method to do physical vapor deposition is to create the physical vapor not through thermally, but through plasma. Uh, again, the same system, the notable difference is now you are not heating the target that you want to deposit, instead you are applying bias to it. And if you apply large enough bias and the uh, few other uh, and in the correct manner, you can actually ionize the gas inside. In sputtering typically that gas tends to be uh, that gas tends to be argon which is very heavy, so that the plasma form tends to bombard the surface and the bombardment, the physical bombardment of the plasma on top of the target it what creates the vapor that gets goes and then deposits on the substrate. This is called sputtering. Uh, the only difference here is then sort of thermal energy, now you are using mechanical energy. Uh, the question I have for you is where have you seen this before? Um, to give you a hint, let me show you a picture of what this actually looks like. So, it glows. Uh, where have you seen this glow before? This is what happens inside a CFL or a, a compact fluorescent tube or a tube light. This is how it actually creates light, right. So, but instead of you creating light here, we are using this glow to deposit things. Uh, after you are doing some additive, you are taking a substrate, you have done some additive manufacturing, now you must, you want to do some patterning. So, the patterning is done using lithography. So, a simple lithography process some looks something like this, you start with substrate, say you have deposited SiO2 on top of your substrate, then uh, you take and you coat something called photoresist. As the name suggests, this is some material that uh, is light sensitive that is photo and is in and is a resist attack of some chemicals, right. So, it is it is protective uh, depending upon whether it has been exposed to light or not. So, you take this photoresist and then you shine light through some mask. So, mask is nothing but a transparent glass in which you have created some pattern. So, whatever pattern you want to make you have now created on this glass and that pattern is opaque. So, when you shine the light, the light goes through certain areas, but does not go through certain uh, regions where there is opaque. Uh, so, whatever pattern you have on the mask now gets transferred onto the photoresist and the properties of the photoresist change depending upon the exposure. Then you take this exposed photoresist and you put it in some developer solution and the developer solution is selective. So, that in this case, wherever the light did not fall, that portion becomes more so becomes more soluble and goes away. So, what you have now done is you have taken the pattern that was on the mask and transferred it onto your wafer. Uh, so, this whole process is photolithography. Uh, the question I have for you is where have you seen this before? Some of you may be too young to know this, but there was a time before digital cameras where they were film based cameras and film based cameras are essentially doing the same thing. Uh, you had to take a you know you had to develop uh, the film in order to get the pat uh, the image and that development was often done in technology using the technology is very similar to what I am telling here. Of course, this is a little more complicated. So, this is what a typical mask looks like. So, you can you can see it has some opaque areas, some transparent areas, uh, the opaque areas typically just to be metal. So, in this case chrome. Uh, the more in, the question now is how do you actually make this in the first place? This sounds like a chicken and an egg problem. Uh, well, you make this using what is called a mask writer. So, a mask writer is simply speaking a laser, a focus laser and that focus laser is mounted on a head that can be moved in the x and y direction. So, it can be computer controlled, you turn the laser on and off and you whatever pattern you have on the computer can then be written on top of the mask. 
and this gives you a mask and then you can use this mask to write several other patterns uh, this pattern several times on top of the silicon wafer which is what lithography is. Uh, typically all this is done in machines called exposure tools uh, they have UV light which is what does the reaction on the photoresist then there is certain optics to make sure that the light is managed well somewhere in the middle is the mask so that it casts a shadow and then somewhere below is a wafer so that shadow gets transferred to the mask uh, from the mask to the wafer. Here are some examples of what uh, uh, various things you can use using optical light we can go down to up to 2 300 nanometers in extreme cases uh, uh, at Intel people have gone down all the way to 22 nanometers. Uh, in our facility at ISC using optical light we go down to up to 1 micron 1.3 microns for smaller features we start using electrons if you have if you start using electrons you get better resolution we can go down to up to 6 nanometers uh, commercial fabs can do even better. So we have done substrate we have done additive manufacturing we have done some patterning now let us talk to subtractive processes how do we remove material selectively. So, supposing you have a substrate in which there is lithographically you have patterned a mask and then now you want to etch this gray area. The simplest thing to do is to just keep it in a solution that etches it for example, if you want to pattern metal you can just keep this in an acid and if you keep this in the acid the acid will attack it and take it away. In this case we are using hydrofluoric acid to etch silicon dioxide and you can use various and you can actually get uh, various uh, shapes depending upon what etchant and chemistry you use. A more get, get becoming more popular and more advanced is something called dry etching where you use the same plasma that we talked about before but the mechanical energy of the plasma is now used to create patterns or rather etch patterns instead of doing the deposition. So you uh, put the substrate such that the ions bombard the surface and etch it away. The mechanism is a little more complex it actually is both chemical and physical etching details we shall look at when we uh, 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 go into that module. So here are some features that we have made at ISC using our dry edge tools. Uh, you can make very thin films, you can make micro needles that are painless for injections, uh, you can make very high aspect ratio structures. Some of these are very hard to do using wet etching so that is where dry edge really shines. Uh, this is a, if I am not wrong a ring oscillator. Mm, but I could be wrong yeah some feature. Uh, finally a few points about process integration. So process integration uh, once you have all these unit processes uh, somebody has to figure out a way how to chain these unit processes together to actually make the final device. That is the job of a process integration uh, uh, engineer and, the pro uh, and that uh, technique is called process integration. Arguably it is one of the more important parts of uh, microfabrication. The goal is to, of course to make the run successful, uh, microfabrication tends to be fairly expensive. So a failed run is a lot of time and money wasted. So the goal of a PI or a process integration person is to make sure that does not happen. What it requires is a very fundamental and detailed understanding of every step. You sort of have to be master of everything like master of all the techniques that are actually being used everything that you have missed or overlooked or assumed will go wrong. So Murphy laws applies in microfabrication very strongly anything that you have not thought of will go wrong. Uh, you have to be intimately familiar with practical details how exactly it happens not just with theoretical details and that requires certain, exper ex certain expertise experience and practice. Also you have to account for the human factor in a lot of these advanced fabs a sample does not is not processed by one person it is handed over from person A to person B to person C. So documentation is extremely important everybody in the chain should know what they have to do and the overall uh, device should still work. Finally hopefully you get to a processed wafer and that processed wafer does not have one chip it is actually a grid of small chips. So you take that wafer and you dice it into small individual dies and each of these dies is a functional device that you can sell in the market. Then each of these devices are then packaged so that they are protected from the environment and damage and then sold right. Now the fact that you take one wafer and you create several devices out of it is important because this is one of the reasons how we reduce cost because as we make things smaller and smaller we are able to cram more and more dices on top of a wafer and that has allowed us to make more devices in the same processing run reducing cost. So with that we come to the end of uh, 
introduction to micro nano fabrication. Uh, I hope you got a feel for what we shall do in this course. Um, uh, what I also hope you shall, uh, what this helps you is get, give you a background in the, some of the jargon that we shall use, things like wafers, semiconductors, doping, uh, lithography, etc. Uh, for details, uh, I shall meet you again for in future lectures.